Everything's being recorded. Yes, got it. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the liquid lecture series. Uh, this is the hybrid edition. So we have a room full of people here at Storybook Brewing Company. We've got some folks joining us from their homes, the comfort of their own homes. Uh, my name is Allie Shook, and I'm the Watershed Outreach Coordinator for the Fountain Creek Watershed Flood Control and Greenway District. And we work from Palmer Lake to Pueblo to take care of the health of our whole watershed. Um, we do that through projects and programs. We just wrapped up our eighth annual Creek Week Cleanup, which is our flagship program where we get folks out to learn about our waterways, make them safer and cleaner. And uh, the results of that have been huge. We had 2,200 volunteers remove 18 tons of litter. So uh, we just wrapped that up and just got a few announcements before we get started. Uh, I did hit the record button, so we will be able to share this out afterwards on our Facebook page if you want to view it again or if you need to leave early. Uh, so this monthly series is part of our collaborative initiative, Colorado's only brew shed alliance. Uh, want to guess what the number one ingredient in beer is? Anybody? It's water. Hey, how about that? So we have 25 member breweries that have raised their hand. They get it. They value water. They want to take care of it and protect it. And so we do, we work with them and they do fundraisers for us. They do cleanups. Storybook Brewing Company had their own cleanup crew for Creek Week. Uh, they also do cigarette butt recycling here and uh, just a great partnership that we have. So to learn about the great work that the Watershed District does, visit fountain-crk.org and you can learn more. So um, this month uh, we're gonna be hearing from my colleague and friend, Jerry Cordova. He puts the storm in storm water. He, he puts the cheer in cheers, and he'll be talking about complete creeks tonight. Jerry is the stormwater specialist for the city of Colorado Springs stormwater enterprise. With a focus on education and outreach, he educates thousands of youth each year through STEM school programs, uh, <clears throat> storm drain marking efforts, and through the storm drain art program, which if you haven't seen those storm drain art, uh, murals, they are fantastic. He is a founding member of our Creek Week cleanup, initiated trash mobs, which are uh, costumed litter cleanups, and he's creating a culture for, com for complete creeks uh, that's, that promotes educational and re recreational opportunities throughout the community. Jerry serves as a board member for the Trails and Open Space Coalition. He has served on the Colorado Stormwater Council as the chair of the Education and Outreach Committee, and he leads the Pikes Peak Children's Water Festival each year. He's quite the guy. Before I hand things over to Jerry, I do want to recognize and thank our Brewshed partners here at Storybook. Um, I want everybody to raise a glass to clean, clean water and delicious beer. And I'll turn it over to Jerry. And I will be monitoring the chat tonight if you have any questions. We're keeping everybody muted, but if you do have questions, we'll be able to address those uh, at the end of the program. So take it away, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to say hello and thanks to everyone. Thank you, Allie, the Fountain Creek Watershed Flood Control and Greenway District. You won't see my face much tonight because I'm going to be uh, just talking and speaking to the slides. So you're welcome for that. And here we go. All right. So to get started, we're talking tonight about complete creeks. And what that is, and I apologize for turning around, but um, it's just the setup we have tonight. So to help keep me on track, we'll utilize some slides. Can but folks, what is. Can folks see the slides? Can you see the slides? Hopefully you say yes. Everyone can see the opening remark. Yes. I've got my contact info there. And then on the next slide, it's got a map. The veins of Colorado Springs, all of our waterways, 24 major tributaries in town. And to start off, what is Complete Creeks? Well, to keep it simple, it really is um, taken from the Complete Streets concept of connectivity. Engaging all of the community that utilizes our roads for complete streets and a nice twist that Alan Boshaw on the line and another colleague Al uh, came up with this term for complete creeks. So shout out to them and a, a huge thank you for starting this years ago by playing in our creeks and our waterways and engaging that right. Um, well, there was risk and there were amenities and they just wanted to go out and have some fun. And that's really kind of where this started. And so complete creeks is the idea of allowing everyone to have access to these amenities that are in our city. Of course, we wanna do that where and when it's appropriate and do it safely. For students of all ages, 
right? All citizens should be able to enjoy our waterways because if we see it, we're likely to enjoy it, do something right, fun and recreational. And when we do that, we're gonna protect it. And that's really our goal. We wanna see a behavior change where everyone is protecting our waterways, learning about them, and they'll last for generations. So Complete Creeks, as I got involved with the city about five years ago, and I was out fat biking the creeks with Alan and enjoying myself, I thought, this is absolutely amazing. This is something that everyone should be able to do. So I was fortunate to uh, go on those rides and see a lot of the view sheds from a new angle, see the creeks from a new angle, see the city from a new angle, things that I never saw before. So I think that if any and all of you were to go out and pick any creek that's in your neighborhood and simply walk along the shore, or if it's dry enough and the water's low enough where you can safely get in the creek, it's kind of like being a five-year-old. You see things from a new perspective, right? It makes you smile. You take big breath, you know, and it's just reviving to see everything that's around you. So when I looked at this, Complete Creeks to me was two concepts. I wanted to incorporate this into my day-to-day -day work. And that meant having an educational component because I'm the education and outreach manager for our group. And then also creating recreational sites. So those are the two components that I really focused on, was how do we incorporate education and recreational activities into the things that we do? Which meant, oh, what is it we do? We built stormwater infrastructure. That's exciting. Ooh, ah, so much fun stormwater infrastructure. Unbelievable, right? Nobody else is excited about that as I am. Whoa, there we go, Woo yeah. Stormwater, we got some engineers in the room, right? It's exciting. It hasn't been. It hasn't been for probably 20, 30, 40 years. Because all we've done is convey water through the city as quick as we possibly can, which meant keeping people out. So this is a huge sea change in people's behavior and in our mission for our group, uh, the Stormwater Enterprise. Because we really want to do this safely where people can get to the creeks and do activities safely. And there are a number of opportunities that I'll show you about, things that we've done in the last five years things we did today that were pretty amazing, and then where we're going forward. And we, from a stormwater enterprise group and division to a larger city and other um, entities are involved in that. So some great visioning is happening. So you'll see what that is. So we'll talk about what Complete Creeks is a little bit more in depth. We'll see why it's important. I think I covered that because we are all part of the city and the community. We'll look at who enjoys the benefit. Well, I said that it's for everyone. Students of all ages, right? Whether you're a formal student, K through 12, if it's collegiate uh, or other professions, but really anyone in the city should go enjoy that. Where are those project sites? We'll look at some very specific examples and see some really neat things. And then how is it being accomplished? Everything costs money, right? And so we've got to figure out a way to fund these opportunities and um, we'll see some of those examples. So I won't read through everything, but some of the items on the screen you look at and you'll see what those educational and recreational opportunities are. And so here we go. Start looking at these in one minute. So I would encourage you as you're able to sit at home, if you're doing that, um, to multi-screen, you could certainly click on some of the links or type those in and um, be able to view some videos. So I'm not gonna show those just with the time constraint we have and the technical challenges we're facing tonight. But feel free to come back, or I'm happy to share this information with the district, with Allie, and you can visit these links. So there's a lot of videos for each of these that I'm not necessarily going to go over tonight. But when did this all start? So I mentioned I started with the city about five years ago. So on the right, you see Global Fat Bike Day 2016. That's really when this started. Uh, I met Alan, I think it was probably late summer, and I had this vision where we wanted to uh, he and I riding in the creeks, he told me about this global fat bike day thing that was going on around the world. I never heard of it before. So I thought, okay, this would be a great opportunity for the city to partner with other groups. Let's be collaborative in nature, form public private partnerships and do this. We have a great opportunity because Sand Creek right by the flea market on Platte Bridge is where we're doing some major work. It was the first IGA or intergovernment agreement we had uh, with this lawsuit that we were in. And it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, yes, beer was involved for the VIPs, 
We started the day with burritos and beer. Uh, that's how I recommend starting every day. <laughs> it's a great way to start the day. Saturday and Sunday, of course, is what I'm speaking of, but you know. So um, we came up with this global fat bike day here in town. And Alan had done this uh, along Fountain Creek and further down, but this tied perfectly in with the city's mission of creating a larger uh, vision of what we're doing. And so this fit perfectly in that. So you can see the project benefits on the right of what happened at Sand Creek and that stabilization project. This image on the left is a Prezi interactive screen. So if you're able to click on that later, you'll go to a bunch of other photos of that event. So essentially what people did, uh, we partnered with Borealis Fat Bikes here in town. It's the like Ferraris of Fat Bikes. Unbelievably light, uh, probably weighs less than my beer does tonight. Unbelievable. So folks came out and they were able to ride a Borealis bike in Sand Creek for probably about 45 minutes. And so it was a nice way to see that and go through what this would be, what is going to happen at Sand Creek. There were five drop structures put in from Platte Ridge to the confluence. Um, it was roughly, what does that say? $5.7 million. A significant amount of work for a half mile of creek, right? But if you had seen this area prior to the COVID, you would have seen a canyon that was probably 20 to 30 feet deep. So every year, Sand Creek was probably 100 feet wide, if not wider in this section, and it eroded a foot a year. So after some neglect and just kind of turning the eye, you know, 20 years later, it's 20 feet deep. So a huge amount of sedimentation had gone down creek, created a ton of pollution problems, hence our lawsuit, um, and the water quality issues. So we had a quantity and a quality issue of flooding and what was happening to our neighbors downstream of us. So we fixed that, we raised up the creek, basically we backfilled it and we added five drop structures and that solved the stormwater issue. I know you're all excited. That was amazing, right? <laughs> but the fun part was, and I'm absolutely amazed at this, is in the design of this project, they came up with what they call navigable drop structures. So those are essentially ramps. And we created two of them along the east side of this entire roadway. So as we were building it, we needed access. So we put a little dirt road in. And then we created a 10 to 1 slope and a 4 to 1 slope. And rather than being the typical staircase that drop structures are in most of modern projects, these areas were actually strategically laid in place, and then the ramps were put at a different angle and grouted. And so a tremendous amount of detail work went into this. Um, Mr. Lazar, who did the work, uh, unfortunately passed away during the project, and there's a commemorative stone memorializing him at one of those drop structures. So we always stop and, and thank him for his work, uh, but that's how this got started. What we did with stormwater, and then in the design phase, created the navigable drop structures so that people could actually fat bike and get into the creek. It's Sand Creek, most of throughout the year, there's very little water. Yes, flash flood is a concern of ours for about two months of the year, but the rest of the time, it's honestly a big playground of sand. And so anyone wants to go out there, I'm happy to chat with you afterwards. There's some great pictures and videos on here. You'll notice on the right, uh, C, Color Spring celebrates Global Fat Bike Day, and that is Miss Christina Navarro. She was the women's mountain um, fat bike champion of the year that year. And so she actually came to town where our Stars and Stripes outfit and did some technical courses uh, for folks in training in the creek. So we had an Olympian help us out with that, which was amazing. Borealis has been great to work with. Um, they provided bikes for us in the past. Some other videos have been on TV. We had one of the anchors come out and ride this with us. Um, so phenomenal stuff. As water freezes, you'll notice the bright blue one in the center. That's Alan riding on ice, right? So the froze and we were able to actually get out and ride on ice. So fat bikes are an amazing way to have fun. So check out the other details there. I'm gonna forward right now and you'll see uh, one of our project managers on the top left talking about those navigable drop structures. There's a question. Will there be a fat bike event this year? Ooh, this year, probably not. We're still going through some COVID constraints and some challenges, um, but hopefully next year we will. Uh, we used quite a bit of material to backfill that canyon that I told you about. That was not really native soil, so it was very adobe in nature, and it 
cause the bikes to just kind of get real clunky and lots of chain problems. So hopefully with all this rain we've been getting moisture, there's more sand now on top of that. It's more natural and that will help out for next year's event. But we'll certainly keep everyone posted and try to get out and have some more fun. All right, so you see the project detail there. You see the <clears throat> kind of horseshoe. That's the navigable drop structure. Um, there are some other pictures in there that talk about that. On the center, you can see the top. That's a picture from back in, what does that say there? Um, where were my years? Looks like it's cut off. But anyway, previous work that had been done on Sand Creek. So you can kind of see the scale of that. During the flash flood season, you see 6,000 CFS, all the water rushing through. So when it rains, it pours. We have serious flooding in this region. Tremendous amount of water. And at the bottom, you can see through that third slide that the pylons supporting the bridge were actually jeopardized. There's a gas line, high pressure main underneath that. That was exposed. Telecommunication lines exposed. The bridge was closed for three days. And we had to backfill that. I think it was 2016. I could be, not, yeah, could be wrong, but 29, 2013 big floods um, caused crazy amount of work. And then on the bottom right, after we did this, we see Alan out there enjoying the fall colors and riding the old fat bike. So crazy needs definitely need to be done. Uh, through that process and the years that it took to go through the design phase and construction, we also worked with Plan COS, a huge visioning document that the city put together uh, through our planning department. A lot of other stakeholders were involved in that throughout the community, but it was a document that helped guide what we wanted to be, what we wanted the city to look like. And so as we did that, part of the big dream or big ideas was complete creeks. It's documented in the 2014 Parks Master Plan, but it was kind of limited in scope. You know, all of those master plans are really a timestamp on the date in which they were published, right? That's kind of where we were. And so when Complete Creeks was kind of started, it was getting people out, but we didn't have quite the vision uh, of where it was going through the stormwater eyes. We didn't have the funding for stormwater like we do now. So between 2014 and 2016, 17, there was a huge financial incentive for stormwater. Uh, which is a great opportunity for anyone who enjoys the parks, the trails, the open spaces, and getting to our waterways. Because this allowed us to work collaboratively and help uh, with those projects. So if we are going to put in a dirt road for access, wouldn't it be great to have that be part of the Tier 1 trail system? Or whatever is necessary for our parks department. So we were adding more trails uh, with that. So it's, in this picture, there's a couple of people from parks. Susan Davies from the Trails and Open Space Coalition. Uh, but a beautiful view. Right? Again, it's getting out and enjoying nature. It's getting out and seeing our city from a different lens. And he's holding a Borealis fat bike on the far right. But that's literally how like those things are. It's amazing. So um, here's Carl Schuller coming up one of the areas here. In this area, there were 65,000 cubic yards of material put in. The boulders they put in place with the, the sheeting that takes place for those drop structures was about 10 to 15 feet deep. It's massive. The engineering is absolutely incredible. There's a close-up in the center of the navigable drop structures and the ramps that you see. And then on the bottom right, that's actually a CSU storm sewer pipe. So there was a lot of reasons to do major work. It wasn't just the city, but also the utilities who had interest in this creek, other communications with the military bases to the east of us. Um, but, you know, back then we had to walk on it across the creek. So. We wanted to explore as much as we could. All right, next slide here. Uh, we've got some litter cleanups to take place. This is more fat biking. Uh, top right, that's another picture of Sand Creek down by the Goodwill on Constitution. There's some, looks like a nice amphitheater. We gotta get out there and play some music someday. Um, and then this is us fat biking through the, what is that area? I, I refer to it as Coleman Park. That's what it's gonna be, but, um, the Sky Sox Stadium. This is right east of the Sky Sox Stadium, right? So there's a little bit of water uh, depth-wise, it's pretty wide, but it's absolutely beautiful to fat bike in. So whether it's summertime, whether it's winter, uh, winter is awesome because it's frozen right on the ice and then kind of get up and down these other areas and laterally across the stream and have some fun. On the right is just a, a graphic from Classic Home showing some development of that area from Stetson Hills down to Constitution. So that area will be constructed through a 
you know, planning phase right now to see what it'll become. Kind of commonly referred to as Coleman Park, uh, which will be amazing. It'll be natural area, natural channel design. There's two ponds there. The creek runs through it, so there's an amazing opportunity to do something water related. It's fat biking, mountain biking. Uh, the topography is great, so it lends itself really nice to do some unconventional things, things that we don't have in this city right now that other communities do. And we're looking at what we could possibly add to this area. It's approximately 50 acres of land, so pretty big size. All right, next slide. Another thing we did in this Complete Creeks Adventure was we uh, worked with the Water Education Colorado group, formed some more partnerships, and we came up with a urban water cycle tour. Right, water cycle because we're water professionals. Cycle because it's bicycle, so kind of a play on words there. But back in June, we got together with some partners here in the room, and uh, we went on a nine-mile ride all downhill along the Cottonwood Creek Trail. We started at Powers Boulevard and went all the way to I-25. So we traversed the whole city, right? And about every mile, we stopped, mile and a half, and we had a presenter or two or three talk about something water-related whether that was development on the east side with Matrix and the Watershed District about watershed issues. Our Parks Department and Frank Costello talking about some of the amenities that they have there and how the trail system is being connected through not only Cottonwood Creek, but into Wolf Ranch and Cordera. And then as we moved into the heart of the city, there was of course some stormwater issues we had there. Uh, we heard from the utilities about drinking water, about the coli, an absolutely remarkable two days of fun. We could register, it was free, for a Friday or Saturday and go on that ride. Uh, but a lot of fun, I think folks enjoyed it and we're looking at doing this again in 2022 in the fall. So more information to come on that. We recommend registering as soon as we release the date. It's absolutely fun. There's some great links on here, but go to the site, look it up. It's just some cool pictures and a little bit more detail on all of the speakers. All right, moving along, we look at Storm Drain Art Project. So on the recreational side, we looked at fat bikes. And now we're looking at community art projects. So our sperm drain art program started in, I think, 2018. That's when we officially kicked it off. And we worked with the downtown partnership, uh, Peak Radar, and our copper, I guess the larger umbrella. And um, I think Coda was a big part of that. And we created the sperm drain art project. The first year we did that, we created nine murals downtown, and they're the black and white ones you see on that graphic. So the idea was, let's kick this off, let's set the bar really high, have great art, and then do the first nine, the first installation, all in black and white. And the reason for that is because they would stand out. They would go through the test of time. So as people went back and we replaced these or do new art, they're all gonna be in color. But it's not very often you see an installation on black and white. So that was something that we, we went with, I uh, um, thank Claire Swinford for the idea, and we created these nine murals. Uh, you can click on those at home or visit the site. Absolutely amazing. Some of these were novice artists who had never done any public art before. The storm drains raise in size from three foot by five foot to some of those larger ones are seven feet by 20 feet. They're quite big. Uh, there was a lot of them all downtown by the Pioneers Museum uh, and through that corridor. So you can see those. And some of the other artists have galleries back then. So it was quite the gamut of people that have been painting in the basement and haven't really been you know, uh, publicly viewed to now have huge installations. So it was absolutely great. And then in the following year since then, we worked with District 11 and we uh, worked with their IB team. And we had four more installations done. Uh, some of those have been on the news, have a lot of pictures and documentation on those. They're around the District 11 admin building on the Uta sale. Today, and I was out there helping me prime those again. We're going to paint tomorrow. They'll be out. So if you're uh, enjoying the Saturday or Sunday of this weekend, go on out and take the Shook's Run Trail and take a look at the new murals. They're going to be awesome. So some new stuff there. Uh, we worked District 11 IB program. We worked with a couple other schools, some elementary schools. Uh, Audubon is down the street from where we're at here. There's one there. At UCCS, um, going through the neighborhood, there was some concerns with traffic. So we did some of these to slow traffic down. We put in, it's kind of like a, a roundabout or a uh, big structure in the middle of the road, but it was not very attractive. It was kind of, yeah, yeah. 
but with some amazing paint, as we'll see in here. So here's a forward a picture. This is one of the drains done by Palmer, some of the other drains that are downtown. And then this one is in Ivy Wild. You see the before and after there. So the colors are just absolutely beautiful, right? It's super vivid. Uh, the, the one at Ivy Wild, like the one in Craigmore, which we'll get to for ECCS, are gateways into the community. So the idea was create an area that would attract people um, and slow traffic, get them to slow down for safety, and then also allow them to walk and see something of beauty in the neighborhood. So if we're doing a gateway, this is a great way to do that. Ivy Wild has a long history of things that have been in town, from baseball teams to the zoo, uh, to all kinds of really cool stuff. And so there's two murals there, it was noted in the paper, um, community opportunity to volunteer. So we did a big paint by numbers. We've had professional engineers come out and do walking tours with downtown partnership. And so it's been very successful. And we continue to do that to this day. One of the top right, um, sorry, the left is the entrance into Craigmore. We want to pay homage to that neighborhood. Not just do art, but some, what is the history here? It's a mining community is what it was. There's a lot of mines up there. So they did a big flagstone and then we added more art to that. So hence the miner's helmet and the shovel and then along that structure, there's this natural beauty. The mountains, some hawks or eagles, it's absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. On the bottom left is a, another form of art we did with a Elizabeth Selby, who's an incredible artist here in town, young lady. She's hyper-realist. You see that if you zoom out on her face, it looks absolutely real. So real that when I pull up my Google and I see everybody, all my friends on Google, she shows up. Like that's how real it looks, right? It's art. It shows up as a person. But you can see how big it is. And the reason I wanted to show that is because we've moved from just the traditional paintbrush artists uh, to other formats. So this is actually a piece of art she did. It's probably 16 by 20. We took a picture, digitized it, blew it up. And now it's seven feet by 20 feet, right? So there's other opportunities besides just the paintbrush artists to get involved in this project. We're looking at doing some mosaic with crushed tile. There's some groups in town who do amazing work. Um, so it's just finding the right spot for that. On the right side, the top is before, the bottom is after. That is a mural that was put in this year in Whitefield Community Park. So it's a huge water structure. On the left is the trail, and then on the right, there's an actually flowing creek that supplies water to um, Whitefield Security and to Fountain through the ditch company. So I wanted to show kind of just the before and after. There's lots of other photos of this online through Mario Sanchez, who is the artist. If you visit him on Facebook, you'll see pictures of this, but you'll notice the blue heron. So again, natural beauty was the idea of this. That great blue heron is probably seven feet tall. It's massive. And because of where it's positioned, when you move around the room, uh, or sorry, not the room, but move around this structure, there's a disc golf course around it. It like looks at you. It's really freaky to see it move. Uh, it's pretty neat. There's some ducks and other wildlife and other things there that uh, are pretty amazing, but I just wanted to show just kind of the basic two before and after. All right, next slide. So other things we're doing. We are looking at fly fishing. Yes, fly fishing in the city of Carver Springs, primarily downtown on Monument and Fountain Creek, which is pretty remarkable. Because most people would say or think the water's polluted, it's contaminated, it stinks, it's gross, what could possibly be living in, right? Well, you can see a couple ladies down here fishing. Um, it's been noted in the paper on what we're doing with Anglers Covey. There's a land lease agreement that we entered into to protect this part of the creek. Uh, there is no trail system at Anglers Covey other than social trails, but we wanted to create that land lease agreement so that they could formally adopt that area and then be the best land steward possible, right? It gives them some more incentive to do that uh, and other legalities to manage that land. It's unbelievable the difference seeing this from two years ago before that agreement till now. The vegetation's incredible. Uh, there's a great canopy system that's been cleaned up. So the idea is we will be able, we as a community, myself, the district, uh, Catamount Institute, Remfi, whoever it is, want to go and do this outdoor education with kids, you'll be able to do that here. 
there's a parking lot, there's bathrooms, there's wash facilities, there's access, there's an outdoor pavilion where we do water sampling. So we can do a bunch of outdoor education and then there's great recreational opportunities. You wanna learn how to fly fish? What better place than to buy your rod and reel and your gear and just walk down the creek? Makes perfect sense. So this was a great opportunity to do that. On the next slide, here's some examples of fish from Fountain Creek. So we have a few examples. Uh, Alan Peake has been absolutely instrumental. He's on the top right there. He has had tremendous tenacity of kicking this off and just forging ahead with you know the mission of I want to build a fish in this creek, more people should build a come out. And it's been absolutely amazing. Um, so a huge shout out and thank you to Alan for doing that. You can see him holding a trout there. Um, that's basically by circle of I-25. There's a park there, Alcomar Park. Huge, you know, draw for kids, playing soccer, baseball, a whole bunch of other stuff. Great trail network, some other cool community art in that section, but that's a pretty amazing trout, right? Not all of them are like that, but you could go out for a couple hours at lunch and cast, you know, you might get something like that. You see the one in the center, that's from right downtown. So that's basically uh, Tejon and I-25, you know, that general area. Pretty good sized trout. Same thing with the one on the left, same thing with the bottom right. So absolutely amazing opportunities. Um, we'll see where that goes. There's a lot of work being done, I'll talk about but some amazing fish, absolutely amazing fish. The next slide, we see our River Watch program. So I mentioned Anglers Company is a partner in this process. Uh, River Watch has been absolutely great. We do water sampling with them. So we check the chemical side of the creek. We're checking for, as the sheet says here, we look at the flow, the actual depth, uh, temperature, of course, the pH, the alkalinity, hardness, and dissolved oxygen. Basically, all those are part of the habitat. The things that a trout need to live, right? That's kind of what it is. This is a statewide program. It's absolutely uh, phenomenal. With David Ike on the, the top left there, doing some samples at his creek with the Cheyenne Creek Club, uh, the other wildlife that's in the area. And then on the right, the picture that's up here, the first one is from 1906. That's downtown Carter Springs on Pikes Peak Avenue. And the sign that's there by the guy fishing says no fishing, right? But he's fishing downtown Power Springs. So urban fishing isn't really new. It's been going on for a long time, but it's time to start thinking about that and see what we can do. And then on the bottom of that slide, uh, this is Becky and David Lineweber and myself in the creek right behind their shop with some of the water samples that I was doing that day. That photo, uh, photo credit goes out to Mike Pock it was part of the COS 150. There's an actual exhibit that's in town. You can see about 50 different photographs that kind of vented now, how the city has changed, um, but absolutely phenomenal. So it's great to be a part of that and continue the legacy. And hopefully someday we'll be able to, you know, take a lunch break and go out and fish the creek. I, if you do that, I would recommend catch and release of the sport. I would not do that for consumption, right? We want to make sure other people are able to have fun too. We take all the fish out, there's none left, that no one else can go out there. So, our gutter bin program. This is another form of I would call it art, uh, as well as protecting the creek. Right? It's artistic, but it has a very real uh, factor to it. So, the top left is a manhole lid downtown that's got a gold medal because it's right by the Olympic uh, headquarters for the basketball. So that's why they're supposed to play basketball. GE Johnson was the first corporate sponsor we had, basically sponsor a gutter bin, okay? So this is a picture of both of them on what the drain looks like. And underneath that in the top and center, it's kind of this big weather sock. That's the filter that's in the gutter bin. So gutter bin is the brand. It's a big filter that's in the storm drain and it's there to catch the small things. So if you're downtown, you're gonna see cigarette butts. You're gonna see, you know, pieces of plastic, little things like that, right? This captures the small stuff. On average, that's probably 20 to 30 pounds every month that we clean those out at every drain. So are our big things bypassed through that? Or if it's a, does it capture a soda, flex it bottle, or what's the determination whether it's in or out? Yep, so the question was, does it, what does it capture? What's in, what's out? If it's a soda can or a Starbucks cup, this will capture that as well. 
but most of the things are fairly small downtown. But if you're downtown, that goes directly to Fountain Creek, America's beautiful park, right? That's where all this stuff goes. <clears throat> we do have larger drain systems throughout the city. And the, basically that net is much larger. It's 12 feet by 20 feet wide. And that's remarkable and disgusting to see that get cleaned out. Um, I found like, sh like cutting shears for lawn stuff. Uh, it, it's disgusting, it reeks. But again, we have those in big neighborhoods and parking lots. And then this is a smaller approach to just keep it clean, right? We say, keep it clean, we're all downstream. This is a great way to do that. It's catching the small stuff that's downtown. So Friday nights when people are out smoking and drinking at the bars in the street, we're capturing a lot of that material. Question. Um, like, is this a measure that we've taken to kind of the demands that we have to do a better job of our watershed management? I'm assuming everyone can hear that. So let me make my first assumption. I would say, in my opinion, we have gone as, as a division, as an enterprise, above and beyond our requirements. So we have an MS4 permit that we are obligated to comply with from the state, part of the Clean Water Act of the federal government, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And there are a number of things we have to do as a, uh, a group to be in compliance with that. So the adopt a waterway program is a great example. It allows volunteers to come out and pick up trash and litter. Uh, we participate in Creek Week, which is awesome, or whether it's a great American cleanup, it engages the public. That would qualify as meeting that goal. This is something that's a, a beyond and a, a, you know, above and beyond that, where it really is getting to the smaller pieces to make sure we're just a good steward of the land as well, that we're protecting all of those downstream of us from here to the Gulf of Mexico. That's how our watershed works. And so this is a great example of going above and beyond. Yeah, awesome. And it's available for corporate sponsorship. So it's the only program we have in a city where we're saying others can join this and get your name out there. So this is right by Wagner Field. This is downtown. How many thousands of people go to those games every weekend or walking by that and seeing this amazing storm drain. Well, it's colorful, it's great, it's got lots to it. So pretty nice way for the uh, public to get involved in the project. What's the cleanup frequency of one that size? These are done monthly. Yeah. So like I said, it's about 20 to 30 pounds per drain. Yeah. Is that crazy? No, I was you're eating the clean out of the water bodies here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know that's not your part. I can only speak to certain parts. <laughs> yeah, so what's the uh, durability like on these things? Like, you know, do they get like they have to be prepared to place so frequently? Yeah, so the big filter system that's in the uh, kind of bed center top, uh, the Mundus bag. We have plenty of those in stock. So if they're ever ripped or torn, if there's something sharp that gets in there, uh, it can be replaced. But typically what they'll do is basically just shake it out, turn it inside out, and it's reused, I don't know how many times, but yeah, it's reused quite a bit. Okay, yep. All right, move on here. And so one of the other things that helped us get this started uh, of doing educational side of complete creeks was flat flood awareness. So it first started by me going to schools and talking about flash flood safety. And I was in a gym working with kids and showing them a PowerPoint presentation and uh, they get distracted and start you know wandering off. And the pictures were really cool and awesome and it was storm water, but they just weren't all that integrated. So I thought, what if we went outside and we talked about flash flooding and we could see where the leaves bend down and the tree limbs bend down and everything looked like it got flooded. They could see that. And so that was the first presentation we did um, with a group where they could see what the flash flooding does. What, how does it change the landscape? What are some of the tattletale signs? From that time, we also did our pollution model with the IV service days throughout town, uh, where we take that outside. And there's been a no number of groups we work with doing that. On the right, even though we're at Sand Creek and there's a fat bike there, that is actually education talk about erosion with Sand Creek Elementary on the top right. So you can learn about the weather cycle, you can learn about the rock cycle, you can learn about geology in the classroom. And that's okay. I did that for a while too. But it's way cooler and much fun to go outside and climb on the rocks and get sand in your shoe 
and be able to see and talk about what's outside. How does this really work? And talk about Pikes Peak, talk about the watershed, talk about all those changes that get from us, Pikes Peak, to the Gulf of Mexico. So they could see erosion in action from an elementary school. On the bottom right is Colorado Springs, um, sorry, that's the Carter State University uh, for a watershed science class. We went out there and we talked about complete creeks and they got to see what that is uh, from Sand Creek in a wide floodplain and compared that to downtown, a monument creek and some of the sculpted concrete view into bridge. Very different waterways, very different constrictions and constraints, both part of the same watershed. Right? And so it was amazing to take those students out and answer questions and have them see the differences of um, the opportunities in our watershed. But that's some examples of the education side. This is our pollution model on the top left, where we do a lot of those town hall meetings. We're talking about the Ch uh, Children's Water Festival in the center. There's about a thousand students a year who participate in that at Pike Street Community College. Great partnership again. And then this year, we were fortunate to work with the Earth Echo and the World Water Monitoring Day. And it was, um, it was two days, right? Two days. Over 250 students at four stations. There was our stormwater station. Uh, the Air Force Academy had a conservation setup where they were creating shower heads for water flow and efficiency. The Catamount Institute was there doing macroinvertebrates. And then Earth Echo doing the World Water Monitoring Day, looking at chemistry, pH, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, temperature. Absolutely amazing. Some of the other things we do, we take kids out and we do cleanups. This is Challenger Middle School out at Shook's Run, uh, and the same thing on the other side, both bottom corners there. And this will be featured in our upcoming hike on the bottom right as part of the TOSS membership. I would encourage you to look up TOSS, the Trails and Open Space Coalition. Uh, we'll all be doing a membership hike in Shook's Run in the near future. All right, some other fun activities. So through Creek Week, this was last year, we partnered with the Crawl Space to do a clean-in crawl. Allie likes to get folks together and go to breweries. She's roped me into a few of these. They were awesome. They were great. Oh my God, it was so hard. I didn't want to go. Did you write your fat face? <laughs> well, I wouldn't write it back on those. <laughs> um, but the cleaning crawl that's on Tejon Street is about a litter cleanup and having fun. So the crawl space RRC remote control club here in town and in Denver gets folks from all over the state to go do remote control car stuff at the creeks, right? And not only do they do remote control car stuff, everyone who participates, like this top right guy with the bag, you have to pick up trash. You're picking up trash, hence the clean and crawl when you're out there. So you're picking up trash to get more points and racing your car, you know, technical challenges, all this really cool stuff. That day, there was probably 80 folks that showed up from across the state. Absolutely amazing. So again, the more creative we are, or out of the box thinking, whatever you want to call it, the more we engage the public and bring them to our waterways, they see it, they're going to want to protect it. And this is a group who's doing it, right? Take a trash bag, get some more points, have some fun, do the right thing for the community. Leave it better than you found it. And that's what they're doing. All right, so these were some studies that have been done in the past, uh, lots of stuff on the shelf. Lots of billions of dollars, you know, different things that have gone on. Um, but on the right side, because I spent a lot of time in Sand Creek, I did another presentation for a group. And I wanted to see in this 15 mile corridor, how does the stormwater intergovernmental agreement look? How much money are we going to spend? In the 20 years we have doing this work, there's over $33 million on Sand Creek. So you can see the stars in the red sections. And some of the blue sections in here, the little dots are where there's trails. What I wanted to look at and focus on is where are those projects and how do they create connectivity? Are we really making the city more accessible? Not only from just the stormwater standpoint, whether that's a detention pond or a small project that we're doing, but in the larger scheme, making it more accessible so you can traverse the city and see the waterways. And this does that in many cases. The one on the bottom right is the new Fountain Creek Watershed Vision and Implementation Plan that's going on, a huge visioning study that is awesome. And so I can't really speak to that much, but there's some stuff on the paper you can read about and things like 
this. What's possible? What could we do in these amazing waterways downtown? We have uh, some interesting spots. So maybe it'll be called the Fountain Creek Yacht Club. I don't know. It was fun, right? <laughs> so we've got Alan in the, in the kayak, Jessica coming through part of Monument Creek before it gets to America, the beautiful park. And then down by El Pomar, there's probably three, four times more water. So I'm happy to say these photos were taken a year from today. That was my Facebook memory, right? That's what came up. Is we want to see, is it possible to go have fun in the creek and actually like float? Boulder's got the tube day. There's some other cool stuff around. But can we, like, can we kayak? So Jessica was nice enough to get some kayaks. And we went out and got in the water, right? Absolutely amazing. So in the top picture, it was probably 25 CFS, 50 feet per second. Down here on the bottom left, it's closer to 75 to 100. So substantially more water, much faster. Again, you can kind of see the fun we're having. It's the wooded area that's right above the pop cycle bridge. That's right above America Beautiful Park. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. This is the uh, South Circle Bridges. You might recognize the split bridge there. That's right by Coles, right by McDonald's. Again, it's views you never would have seen. And then of course, I'm going to go out fishing and you know, play in the creek, kayaking, or my bike helmet, funny suit, and have a trash grab because I got to pick up some trash. Down. So, the lessons learned there's a lot of sand in Sand Creek. That was Lee sinking up to his knee. He actually just sunk. So, both legs are straight. Well, he's got one bent there on top, but the other one is straight. Right? He just fell in the sand. So, we need to do things better than we've done in the past from a stormwater standpoint. We need to create more amenities. There's things we can do that we haven't thought of before. Who knows what's going to be possible? But there's some amazing things going on with the visioning task force that's out, uh, some other ideas that our group has, and those I think will come through fruition. I think there's a lot of good stuff. So this one says where the trail ends. I don't necessarily think that's really relevant. It just means you need to change your mode of transportation, right? And there's a lot of other stuff you can do. And then at the top, that's uh, Council Member Yolanda. I'll be allowed, uh, out riding the bike with Alan there on the tandem. So multimodal, making it accessible for everyone to use. Regardless of ability and challenges, we should all be able to enjoy these amendments. And that's a great way to do it. So with that, I will say thank you very much and show you a picture of an amazing bridge on Shook's Run that is an entrance way into Concrete Coyote, another phenomenal group. So thank you all for your attendance and listening. I'm happy to answer any questions and follow up. And I'm happy to make the slides available. Check out the links. Check out our website. There's some really fun stuff happening. Thank you. About three or four slides ago, you showed uh, a reach where, uh, yeah, right there. Is that all concrete, that reach, or what? This is all Sand Creek. Sand Creek. Downtown, we're at the confluence of Fountain Creek and Sand Creek. Um, uh, it's just south of Nevada, and then it goes up to Stetson Hills, Dublin, that area. Yep. Are you using studded tires, dried or nice, or just regular flat nope. Yeah, so if you're on a fat bike and you're riding on ice and snow, uh, um, on the trails during a warm day, sand if you're out today, you might have 10 pounds to 10 PSI in your tires. When we ride on the ice and snow, we will we'll drop those down to about four. You can literally squash the tire yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Um, so Sand Creek like comes in about Costco, right? Or the Costco. Sand Creek? No. What's the one that crosses over? So you got Monument Creek coming north south, and then there is South Douglas and North Douglas Creek uh, going east west. Okay. A lot of it go up. Yeah, like I'm taking one year and it gets to be a really deep canyon, and then you pop back up and you're. Yeah, if you're at Costco, Rock or, or yeah, if you're at uh, Stetson Road, I think that's what that is. Uh, the bridge where that had a big sinkhole and replaced that whole bridge. That's probably the canyon we're talking about, going through Holland Park, then up to Centennial, across yeah. under Centennial, and those both go by. Uh, find that bridge. Yeah, I tried to go to the garden and got that way. Uh, but it's kind of weird. Like, you're so yeah. deep in there. Right? If you 
do that, why don't stop at our red light? You better get, get, get your <laughs> 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 stay hydrated. It's a big hill. <laughs> oh, wait, another weird thing happened. Um, so a person cold called me about Sand Creek and said, Would you agree to do community engagement events? And I was like, For what? And they were like, We're putting in a bid. I think for the project you're talking about. At Colin Park? In San, in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, well, that we are in business of community engagement, but like, we're cute. And yeah. they basically were like, we're not allowed to say because we're a bitter project. Like, are you getting a, a <coughs> There is an RFP that's out. What's the master plan? Yeah, it was just kind of weird. It was like they wanted to write in their proposal that they wouldn't be to community, but they had reached out to the nonprofit to the car and they decided to do it for them. Yeah. So you would do it for them? Hmm. Yeah. I know it's interesting. <laughs> Question. Um, funding. Did you guys get that from the lawsuit or? Um, do you just reach out to different businesses? Yeah, say? great question. So where does the money come from? Mm -hmm. Right? At the IGA is all um, departmental funded because okay. of the loss of the debt. Okay. So it's nice to have those uh, 20 years to do four and a half million dollars worth of work. And that's a huge part of that. But it's been extended with some other votes. And uh, yeah, we have definitely you know, utilized the federal government in you know, those disaster declarations and all those funds that are that. There's multiple funding sources that uh, are approved and never been funded like this before in the past, but I'm aware of it. Um, I think that would be the same for El Paso County. Yeah. And we're not as high up on the list. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we should talk. I'm sure there's a link to connect and collaborate. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Sure. Other questions? So when we talk about accessibility, kayaking, biking, like what about like true accessibility, say I'm like in like a wheelchair, how am I going to like plans for that? Like ADA. So great question. I love the accessibility issue. Uh, our town in general, I don't think accommodates folks who have uh, that need to be dealt with for accessibility issues. There really is a fear of accessibility in many uh, areas. Parks in general and trails is a challenge because of the terrain. The tier one system is great, but it doesn't really address the same labeling that folks with disabilities use in their plans. So our, our we have a tier one trail and they use an alpha system, A, B, C, D. They use one, two, three. So that doesn't mean the apples and oranges, you know, make the right trail mix or fruit mix, whatever it is. <laughs> so we're not talking the same language. And that's a big struggle. So I think that when it comes to recreation uh, or the educational side, we should be able to do that. So I think a great example is if it's doing water sampling, whether we look at biological chemistry, we could get samples from the creek right there at Fountain Creek and take those up to anyone's cubby and there's an outdoor pavilion. So someone with a wheelchair could get from the parking lot to that little pond and then there are picnic tables and there's a shade structure and we could do any of those water tests there. The recreational side, uh, at Prospect Lake, they actually have stand up paddle boards where they bug like strap with ratchets, wheelchairs. So folks can get on a stand up paddle board in a wheelchair and then go out and paddle and you know, do stuff. So I don't know what the answer is, but I'm certainly a proponent of that in big where I can to help out. That's some great ideas. So I've got lots of pictures. There are some places where they've done things like that that we really should be universally accessible. And there's challenges with that, but where and when you can, do it. Yep. Take pictures. So yeah. we can show others. <laughs> what <would> Jerry do? <laughs> <laughs> Take more pictures. Yeah. Other questions? So for the um, bad biking areas, um, is it kind of just where the ramps are installed that you're allowed to do that, or can you go like as far as you know, the bikes, or how does that? 
Sand Creek is great because again, sand. And then the navigable drop structures were put in at every structure. On the opposite side, there's a single track trail that kind of goes up and down uh, and allows you some creek access that way. We want to put specific areas where people get into the creek and you can cross at any, any of those structures. You can either bike, as Hannah saw, this amazing guy from CC, went halfway down the navigable drop structure and then popped his bike over like this, hopping, and then went across the entire thing. I've never seen anyone do that. So we want to make sure we're not causing more erosion, that we're not destroying the land by just bushwhacking, like, oh, they won't go up the hill here. All right, take one of the trails, whether it's an navigable structure or that creek side and get in and out of the creek. So that's lots of places to need. What else? Good stuff. Okay. Great. I'm here next Tuesday, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> closing comments. I mean, these are really amazing ideas, and the work that we do together is collaborative. And this is really water touches every aspect of our life. Everybody needs water. Everybody is benefited by the the beauty of water, by the sound of water, by the wildlife supported by our waterways, and. We really need more political will to say we deserve better in our community for the health of our waterways, for the beautifulness of our environment. And, you know, so it's really about folks like you showing up and figuring out what that next step is for you in your own life. Maybe you can take a conservation step, you know, one step further at your house. Maybe you can go out and do a cleanup on a Saturday, bring that trash bag with you when you're out doing your recreational activities. Um, so we're here to support any interest you have in benefiting our waterways, whether it's drinking great craft beer, whether it's wildlife photography. We have some um, beautiful uh, beer bottles right now at Local Relic. We had a photo contest and we've got beautiful photography of our local watershed on beer bottles now. So things like that, uh, you know, great opportunities to engage, educate, support, and promote the thing that we all need every single day. Um, we do have uh, our next liquid lecture is scheduled for the third Thursday in November, that's the 18th, once again at six o'clock, and that will be uh, on recycling. So we have some issues with recycling here and a lot of education that can be done around how do we really recycle right. So we're going to hear from a uh, staff member from the Bear Creek Nature Center about that, and that will be, I believe, at Metric Brewing Company, we're still working on finalizing, but stay tuned for that. Um, and then we are partnering with the Trails and Open Space Coalition to do the second annual virtual Wild and Scenic Film Festival. So this is a film festival that we are going to uh, put out for Thursday, December 3rd at 5 o'clock. And we'll have a virtual option or a live in-person option right here at Storybook. So um, stay tuned for that. It'll be some really great inspirational stories about equity and water and communities coming together over things that they really care about. Um, so we have, you know, we have greenways, we have highways, we have byways. These are all places that help us get from one place to another. And Alan just told me today about his idea for a creekway, which, you know, creekways will take us along our trails and take us on different journeys. So want to shout out to Alan for that great idea. Um, another thing to save the date for, we're doing our spring cleanup. It's called the Great American Cleanup that will happen in May of 2022. So we just finished Creek Week. We need a break. We're going to go forward again in the springtime once that snow melts. So please join us for that. And thank you all for your time and interest in our waterways. And everyone, again, we should blast clean water. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.